We've seen a lot of big EVs on the market, but what about the small ones like the Renault Megane E-Tech or the Megane EV? Here in Autogefühl with Thomas, let's go! This year sits on a dedicated EV platform together with the Nissan Aria. However, the Aria are a way bigger vehicle, but they do share the tech. Interesting here that the daytime running light is just in that lower area here. And the turning indicator you can see here, top one here, full LED. Here you can also see the daytime running light. I'm just activating here the open and close with the key cut. You can see it. also a nice playing of the light signature here in the top part. So they have some interesting ideas and also with that key card, just when you approach the vehicle, it opens. When you leave, then it closes. And now it gets really interesting because the length is only 4 meters 20 or 165 inches. So really a short EV. Even the VW ID3 is six centimeters or two and a half inches longer than this one here. So finally also a small or compact EV. Well, they are still pricey overall, but cheaper than the big EVs, of course. And Nissan Ariba, by the way, is like this longer, so big difference. 18 or here, 20 inch wheels. These are the bigger ones. So massive styling, this crossover styling also with the crossover wheel arches right here. And the very slim window line here, raising design line overall. Pretty strong appearance. It doesn't look like as it would be so small. And why does it look so strong in the rear once again? Because that really tiny window that leaves this massive area right here. You can see all of the color and so on, and also the light signature and so on. Here, these are the turning indicators. And there you can see the light signature goes all the way across the vehicle. That looks really very cool. And one disadvantage, of course, when you have that small window here, yeah, it's really hard to see from the inside to the outside. But they also thought about an interesting solution in this respect. Soon going to show you that. Front wheel drive only this vehicle. And the acceleration figures, depending on the version you have, 10 seconds or 7.4. And battery sizes, either 40 or 60 kilowatt hours net. Here today we have the bigger one. And that translates in ideal conditions into a range that is something less than 400 kilometers or less than 250 miles. Also later more about the efficiency or the energy consumption we score here in our test today. As for recharging, 22 kilowatt AC. That's special, especially for this segment here. And then you like you need like three hours for charging. And then DC 130 kilowatts. So when you have a proper charging station, then you need some 35 minutes, 10 to 80% state of charge. Inside of the doors, top part here is hard pack. Then here we have a nice microfiber insert. Here, this could be a little bit softer when you put your elbows on it, but overall good build quality. Here's some felt being used. And interesting also, the seats are from 100% recycled material. That is great. Here you have the bright fabric, Scandinavian furniture design style, or there's also a black styling available. Here with some leather on the outside, so all animal free. Only the highest trims, they come with animal skin. Steering wheel is animal skin wrap in the higher trims, only animal free in the lowest trim actually. And interesting that button wise, it's very well to control. You have some capacitive buttons, but it's a mix, you know, some capacitive, some real. So overall the user interface on this vehicle is quite good. Seating position, well, it's a small vehicle, but rather feels compact vehicle here in the front. Headroom, 1 meter 89 or 6 foot 2. Still a lot of headroom left, no problem at all. And the seats are also very comfortable, nice and soft, but also, you know, durable enough. At least that's how they feel at this moment. So it's actually a very nice cockpit. Also, this whole layout here and steering wheel goes up and down manually. Um, yeah, it's maybe not the nicest process, but it does the job. And this is the cockpit overview. Really clean, nice layout. More than look for the steering wheel, digital instruments, and on the right side, either 9 inch or here the optional 12 inch infotainment. What's really cool here is that bright fabric on the dashboard that creates a very nice atmosphere in the interior. Digital instruments look like these, and when you pick the driving modes, it adapts actually, it shows in a different color also counts for the ambient lighting, for example. And you can also switch that whole view. So um, you have different total views like this. It's like, an, you know, like a map view you can see here. It does not flicker in real life, by the way. It's just hard to pick it up on camera. That doesn't flicker on both screens at the same time. 
or you have this one in here or this I would say emulated analog style with the round gauges. Here you also have recuperation pedals to change the recuperation modes. More to that while driving. We need to talk about the stock columns as well. Here this is then the shifting lever, drive, reverse, park. And then you have a second stalk here for the wipers and it's really close to each other and you can mistake one for another while driving. And then there's even a third one and that one is even underneath. And the good thing is you can also control the volume then just when reaching behind the steering wheel and also next title by you know, turning that disc here in the, in the part here behind. Renault users know this device, it's kind of old school, it's good to have it. But then again, three stock homes on one side. Hmm. This infotainment system is really interesting because it is Android Automotive. So there's a difference. Android Auto is like Apple CarPlay, the direct smartphone mirroring. Android Automotive is the whole system that Volvo is offering Polestar and now also Renault. It means it's Android based and you have it in a very simple way. Everything is straightforward and you have native Google Maps embed. And that is of course an awesome thing to have. Really responsive. That's how it's done. Audi, BMW, Mercedes, VW spend billions on their own infotainment systems and they fail. This one is faster. It's better. Has Google Maps. Everyone wants that for uh, navigation. Well, and at the same time, you can have Android Auto and Apple CarPlay here. I mean, this is perfect. So why not more manufacturers go this way? They will have to, I guess. The Apple CarPlay integration is also really cool, very large, and you can easily pick your songs and so on. And also can use <laughs> Google Maps inside there. But in this case, you can save all your data from your smartphone and then use the, the car for the direct um, uh, Google Maps here, so I'm really happy with that system. And we have Harman Kardon sound system in here. And I have to say, great surround sound, especially for this vehicle segment here. Thumb up below the screen, that's really interesting. Here, still real knobs for climate unit, vent strength and so on. So that's a good user interface that we still have that. And below that, this is an inductive charging pad. Lower middle console has a lot of space and here you set these individual. You can set them a little bit uh, wider, for example, that you can have, you know, like big bolts or small bolts. And this is here another cup holder. Then you have this armrest, can put it up, it's a leatherette cover. And then more space underneath. As for the rear doors, here the hands are there. So it's a nice integration. Why not? Also the nice bright fabric design with a leather red mix for the rear seats. So the styling here overall, really cool, very modern and cozy. However, here, yeah, for four or else, nothing really special. So I do hit my knees here. It's a short vehicle, so it's no wonder actually. If you would put the seat a little bit higher, then I could fit a little bit better in this recess here. Headroom wise here, however, it's actually quite okay. I do fit in here. So considering that this car is so short, the offering of space here on the rear is actually quite decent. And even if you sit here in the middle, yeah, it gets close as for the knees, but when the drivers are a little bit shorter, maybe put the seat forward, then you can for short periods even use that one with five adults, not the tallest ones, but at least it works somehow. Two USB-C chargers, by the way, here in the middle console. This is, by the way, here the extras list. And there you can see the higher trim with a big battery, already close to 50,000 euros. And then we have some extra equipment. We always land at, yeah, a little bit less than 50,000 euros then. You open the trunk here with this button, and it's a manual hatch. And it's around 400 liters, and it's quite spacious. You can see here, you can put a cabin trolley even upright in that one. However, then there's a very, you know, high loading sill, but overall you can see these 400 liters of capacity very well usable, although there's this, you know, high loading sill, but then you gain a lot of height. Well, I don't understand here when you close it, it always crushes down. You hear that? Who designed this? And why? I mean, did no one actually see that in production? Or I'd say before production? Width, some 90 centimeters or 35 inches. Height is almost 80 centimeters or 30 inches, so that's actually quite cool. And also length about 80 centimeters, 30 inches. 
your cables you can store here underneath actually even more space and we fold the seats from the rear area and then you get 145 in centimeters or 57 inches welcome to thomas's driving lounge with the renault megan e-tech or renault megan ev that's how i call it to keep it simple we have here different driving modes. We'll pull to sport mode, Ooh, also flashing everything in red and the instruments. German Autobahn, freeway, the motorway here, famous German motorway from 40 kilometers an hour. Let's accelerate to top speed, let's go. Top speed, 160 kilometers an hour, 100 miles per hour. Ah, it goes even 166 kilometers per hour. You know, the tachometer usually shows a little bit more speed than it really is on GPS. But that went quick, definitely from the get-go. Then it slowed down bit by bit. The acceleration figure, zero to one kilometers an hour, six to miles an hour, 7.4 seconds. Here it feels very good to handle actually on the motorway at high speeds, not too loud because this is not a typical speed than here the top speed, but the lane changing here, very nicely done. Good feeling from the steering wheel as well. The suspension is doing a good job, although we have the big wheels here. It's not too uncomfortable, but really keeping the car upright, low center of gravity because of the battery pack and here at a motorway speed of 100 kilometers an hour, 60 miles an hour, also reasonable as for the noise insulation. So, yeah, I mean, we know these days where some of the French vehicles, besides maybe like a Megane RS or something, but most of the base setup of the French vehicles were rather like on a soft note. And here with the electric vehicles, with a low center of gravity and, you know, a little bit of a sportier approach also, also that the car doesn't shake up. So it feels pretty agile and sporty indeed that is uh, that is very interesting interesting surprise you know in tunnel you can see more of these driving modes and also then here when i go to the normal comfort mode for example it switches back to this more bluish surrounding and we can also see that here in the ambient lighting that is really nicely done and that ambient lighting once again switches here for example in eco mode model yellow sport and then in red so very nice ambient lighting here and also according to the driving mode that's pretty cool the driving modes don't make the biggest difference usually probably you would keep it in normal comfort mode let's take steering wow this is like hmm, very sudden reaction from the steering sport mode a little bit faster but then you know when you're at higher speeds and have it gentle but it, whoa that's interesting so when you turn the steering wheel a little bit more so I'm usually very smooth with steerings you know so like this and you have to do that when you're in this vehicle because when you apply a little bit too much of that steering you feel like putting that car all over the place so hmm and why is this one not really driving let's see that's a nice thing you to do with that EV Changing that MX-5, it was slowing down for whatever reason. Well, this is really cool, nice handling, but yeah, when you push that steering too far, it reacts a little bit too harsh, too arcade ally, too much in a computer game simulation or something. That's, by the way, also the thing with the back mirror. So when I put it to the camera system, I have actually a better view through that digital back mirror because the normal back mirror, I can't see stuff here when I look out, but it's like very slim window. But the, th the thing is, here by the mirrors, top, right, left, I always have a three-dimensional image of my surrounding. And when I look at a screen, this just fakes three dimensions. It's not really three dimensions, it's a 2D screen. And that's why I can't really estimate the distances, you know. So I see more in a way, but I see less in the sense of 
I have a feeling what's going on behind me and where is that vehicle. So when I see it on the screen, I know there is something, but I have no idea where it actually is. And that's why I'm always a fan of the normal solutions. One thing, of course, we, yeah, in this case, when it's really slim in the rear uh, window, or when you put the luggage all the way up to the you know, very top, that everything is blocked in the view, then it would make sense. Assistance systems here. Let's also go back to the normal comfort mode. And then we can activate, for example, the cruise control, adaptive cruise control here, left side of the steering wheel. Um, these buttons here are, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a mix of capacitive and rear buttons. It's okay. They also give some kind of feedback. And here you set then the cruise control speed, and that's well done. I'm fine with that, definitely. So, and yeah, so far it's working quite well. There is a blind spot monitor, let me show you that. So now when the car is coming here, it should be appearing right now. There we go. So it's in the second, the car is in that blind spot, not in advance. That's the philosophy also of the French manufacturers at PSA, so Peugeot Citroën. I don't share this opinion. I rather want a warning in advance and not too late, actually. So, but you can argue for that. Now, like 120 to 160, let's go. 30, 40, 150, that's enough for now. You see, there is still something coming as for the, the acceleration. So, even though it's not the strongest EV and you have front wheel drive only, you have sufficient power on the motorway, just not that super high top speed, which is definitely a German thing. So here, when the car goes 160 max, yeah, you're in a very, very low spectrum. And as for comparable cars, or also the comparable petrol cars and so on, but also noise insulation wise, is also not meant to be driven that, you know, that, that fast, actually. As for the fuel economy, of course, it gets boosted. Fuel economy, energy economy, of course, it gets boosted when you drive so fast. Oh, a nice RS5. It's first generation RS5, actually, that's pretty cool. But a uh, silver design. So, and now we're getting off the motorway right here. Yeah, it feels really agile, a lot of fun. We'll also do some agile winding corners very soon. See about the concert driving fun in these serpentine corners or roads. That's pretty cool. Yeah, the only thing is just when you go like slalom really quickly, then the reaction of the steering is too harsh. Other than that, it's very good driving. I mean, it's a lot of fun. It feels very compact. It is compact and suspension is not too bad because remember, there's multi link rear, rear axle or rear suspension. That's also very rare for a vehicle in this size here, in this not even shortness, but maybe like, yeah, <laughs> this length, this shortness. So overall, I mean, this is sporty step from suspension, especially with the big wheels. But, you know, we have seen that the exterior is likable. We've seen that the interior delivers here a cool lounge atmosphere. It's also still comfortable in driving, also for tall passengers. Something I do notice by driving is that some of the surfaces that look cool, but are maybe a little bit too hard. Yeah, I know some like it hard, but not maybe in any case. <laughs> so here um, in the middle console, my knee is, you know, you know, touching that really hard thing. It's just like a very, very thin soft leather red cover. The same also for the, my left elbow. It's not too soft. And also here in the middle console, it's not too soft. I like to drive relaxed here with the elbows resting left and right. And it is somewhat okay, but it's not really soft and not super comfortable. So a little bit softer dampening here, here and here. That would have been cool. Actually, I would, would definitely appreciate that. Other than that, what else we can talk about? Recuperation is an electric vehicle. And when you start up the vehicle, there's a standard recuperation set and manufacturers do that because the homologation has to be in this specific one mode and then you can all do the driving cycles and the consumption test and so on and so on therefore one has to be standard 
and this is the one with some slight recuperation. I lift my foot off the throttle or the accelerator pedal, pedal here in the electric vehicle and there's some, ex, uh, some um, deceleration, some regenerative braking and then I can also diminish that completely. I can let the car roll by putting that pedal here on the right side. So just rolling, 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 ha. Huh. And then I can also use the left pedal, go to back, go back to the mode. One more, so more regenerative braking, and then even more. That is then the strongest possible with three, you know, dots inside there or three small arrows. And here you can see I stop before I want to stop. Actually, here I have to apply some throttle once again. And now, but the car is not coming to a complete halt, so it's. I would say it's not the 100% one pedal driving feeling here, but here with a strong recuperation, you hardly have to use the brake pedal sometimes, and here when you want to come to a final stop. Um, of course, the regenerative braking is always working, no matter in which mode you are in there. That is, oh, that is. You seen that, guys? That BMW, that was not okay, that tuning, right? That looked a little bit weird, didn't it? So back there to the EV here. Um, with the regenerative braking, of course, always when you use the brake pedal, it is active. So if you do it by lifting the throttle and putting the mode here stronger, or if you're pressing the brake pedal yourself and have rather the rolling mode activated, it has no effect on the, oh, that's a Honda E, has no effect on the concise regenerative braking you do gain, do, you do actually. It's just a different method, actually. And which one I prefer? Mm, rather when it's not that strong, but when it's adaptive, you know, when it's, for example, working together, if that's car in front of you or not, that's to me, I think, the favorable solution, that you sometimes have to have it the region, sometimes not. Then again, people can say, mm, yeah, it's not predict predictable. It's also a very good aspect. I thought about this and so maybe the adaptive recuperation is only solution when it's very, very well done. Or you say, you know, here like Renault does, hey, we put some recuperation and that's it, you know, and people should get used to that actually. And then if you want more, press the brake pedal. Yeah, there's always a big discussion about what's actually best. And now, agile corners, let's put in that sport mode. Let's see, front wheel drive only, if we have some understeering. Here in the sport mode, definitely the throttle input is way more spontaneous. Here rough road, we also feel more of these big wheels then, so if you want more comfort, stick with smaller wheels. Yeah, here road is slightly wet, and we have all that EV power. Then you maybe also heard that we had some wheel spin there in the front. Not too bad though. Let's see here. Direct steering, yeah, you have to be very cautious. So a little bit wet road and sport mode doesn't really work that well. Then you do have under steering, so you have to be very gentle with the throttle or stick with the combat mode. Then the vehicle is definitely better to control. So of course, moist building up in the outside, but it's really wet actually, outside and hot at the same time. So maybe that might be just the weather conditions. It's a lot of fun actually to steer it here in these corners so actually great handling so because it's so short it has a low center of gravity and you don't feel that weight of the batteries you know that the evs are always heavier because of that battery weight but here since it's short and you have the low center of gravity it's really a lot of fun to drive really very very cool just that i do prefer the rear steering for the EV, especially because they have so much power, just makes more sense in my opinion. Yes, then again you can say mm, you can have better recuperation when you have the front electric motor, then also depends if they offer an all-wheel drive, that you have two electric motors, so there are always pro and cons to the drive systems, but hey, I'm always arguing for the driving fun and then of course rear-wheel drive is more fun actually. Now going downhill, being in the big recuperation mode, then I just have to put my foot off the throttle and there you can see, even though it's very steep now, 
the car is still decelerating and then we can also get back some of the energy and the consumption you know when I had some acceleration tests in here now so that one brought it a little bit more up but I did some earlier driving tests and it's still close to that figure so my average figure here for different use cases and so on is something 16 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers so that's like 26 kilowatt hours on 100 miles that would translate into a third 375 kilometer or like 240 miles range so this is quite good conditions when it's warm at here now ac has also been running so we're driving slowly here because the doggies that's also a good thing to have the EVs. We don't uh, annoy the doggies here, which can, you know, they can they can hear, of course, really, 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 really well. So here we go. So um, back to the range. Quite good conditions for the EVs. Not too cold. Of course, it might be different in wintertime or if you speed it up constantly on the motorway. But considering the size of the vehicle, and I mean, it has a decent battery size, definitely, when you pick the bigger one. I think that range is definitely good and also the efficiency is actually just fine. We had some better efficiency within this and Aria, but that were, you know, even better conditions in that case. And also then of course the bigger battery um, is also available for the Aria so you can, you know, maximize it up as for the range. But overall I think very good here also in the driving test. Is it one of the best small EVs? I think we can very well say so. And you can compare now the VW ID3, for example, or the Cupra Born. They are approximately the same size.